It is by all accounts one of the most famous pieces of Jewish art in the world and the most recognizable depiction of Jewish prayer. Yet few can name its artist, nor know much about the poignancy and sadness that surround his story. His name was Maurice Gottlieb, born in an Orthodox Jewish home in Galicia in 1856. He studied art across Europe, and in his early 20s, he gave us this image, what is now known as Jews praying in the synagogue on Yom Kippur. In the midst of the men, Gottlieb has given us a self-portrait of himself. He is the young man leaning meditatively on his arm. He's identified by the medallion that hangs upon him, which bears his initials, Mem Gimel, Moshe Gottlieb. And he is clad in a strange sort of garment that seems somewhat akin to both a kittel and a talit, but which is not quite either of them. No convincing account has been given of this sartorial selection, but it can perhaps be explained by the woman whose face appears at least once, if not more, in the painting. Behind Gottlieb, we see a women's section, and on the left, a woman standing, holding a sidur. This is Laura Rosenfeld, to whom Gottlieb had proposed, but who in the end refused him. Gottlieb still pined for Laura, and perhaps expressed his anguish with this strange and striking garment. After all, talitot and kittels were worn in Eastern Europe only after marriage, and this deliberately inexact approximation may hint to his own dream of marriage deferred. But it is not Laura's presence in the painting that is most interesting, for there is more than one Maurice Gottlieb on this canvas. On the left, there is a young lad clad in a golden garment. He too bears a medallion with the very same initials a sign that Gottlieb has given us an image of himself as a young boy. This in turn allows us to understand that the young man on the right of the canvas, of almost identical appearance, is also Gottlieb as a youth of a slightly older age than his own personification on the opposite side. Here, he is depicted sitting next to a man which is perhaps Gottlieb's father. Thus, Gottlieb has given us three different stages of his own life and then a fourth, final one. If you look to the Torah scroll whose beauty captures our eyes in the middle of the scene, we will note a small shield or plaque that hangs upon it. Etched upon the plaque are Hebrew words, which read, the crown of the Torah given in memory of Ramosha Gottlieb of blessed memory. Gottlieb, in other words, has given us an epitaph for himself. He is in this artwork simultaneously alive and remembering his own passing. What about the scene that he was depicting brought about this sudden, seemingly moribund meditation? Godley was once asked this question by an intimate, and his response deserves to be carefully considered. He replied, I myself have no answer, but as I was painting this picture, a special mood descended upon me a feeling of sadness and despair. And I imagined that ghosts from the grave appeared before me, members of my family who had long since expired. And they surrounded me and looked at me with their dead eyes as if to say, bring us back to life. And so I drew them from memory or from old photographs I had of them. And as I placed them in true and living colors upon the canvas, my heart fell and I placed myself among them. A tumult of emotions passed over me as I witnessed my ghosts arise before me. And I thought to myself, we have little time in this world. My life too shall fade away. My eyes will close. And who can promise me that tomorrow I shall not be among those who rest in eternal sleep? And as I thought these thoughts, a higher power guided my brush and behold, I stand before this inscription as a man stands before his own grave. To this very day, Gottlieb concluded, I cannot solve this mystery. Thus, 
The kaftan-clad man clasping the Torah to himself is perhaps an embodiment of Gottlieb's ancestors. And the letters on the Torah signify that one day he, Gottlieb, will join his progenitors. That such a vision possessed Gottlieb is enormously eerie because soon after this painting was completed, Maurice Gottlieb took ill and passed away, either through natural causes or, as some suggested, due to heartbreak. The man who reflected to his friend that we have too little time in this world, he, in the end, had precious little time indeed. Today, if it is not overly audacious, we will attempt to address the very mystery that Maurice Gottlieb himself claimed that he could not solve. What might have inspired the artist to paint and ponder mortality in this manner? What about the scene served as the source for this inspiration? In seeking an answer, we must place the painting in the context of the Jewish liturgical calendar. The image was not originally linked to the Day of Atonement. But as Ezra Mendelssohn notes in his book on Gottlieb, the artist had indeed informed his friend that he was inspired to create this painting during the Aseret Yimei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance preceding the Day of Atonement. And that therefore, this painting, it seems, truly captures a moment during the holiest day of the Jewish year. But which moment, what point during that day of days is Gottlieb seeking to depict. In obituaries for Gottlieb following his death, it was asserted that the painting portrays the scene in the synagogue right before Ne'ilah, one of the most inspiring periods of prayer in the Jewish year, right at the end of the Day of Atonement. In support of this contention, others have noted that at the bottom left of the canvas, one can see peeking out a shofar which will be blown at Ne'ilah's conclusion. The problem is that the most prominent object in the painting, the very Torah on which Gottlieb has placed his epitaph, belies this interpretation. If Nila is about to begin, if Mincha is concluded, then the Torah should no longer be out. It would already have been returned to the Ark following the finishing of Mincha in the afternoon. Some have suggested that we find here in this scene the prophetic reading, or the Haftarah, or Haftorah, as Ashkenazic Jews would have called it, the Haftorah of the afternoon, the reading of the book of Jonah. For it is during the Haftorah that the Torah is held in such a manner. But it's not at all clear why Gottlieb would have chosen to portray that precise moment. And moreover, if one looks to the reading desk or bima behind the man holding the sacred scroll, we will see that nothing is publicly being read. No one seems to be declaiming the Haftorah or doing much of anything at all. In fact, Though this painting is known to depict Jewish prayer, no one really in this painting appears to be praying. The Gottlieb figure seems lost in meditation, and the same can be said for the man holding the Torah. And most importantly for our purposes, the artist's personification of himself as a child on the left of the canvas appears to be in the process of departing the sanctuary. I would suggest that a familiarity with the rudimentary rhythms of Jewish liturgical tradition allows us to attempt an explanation of the details in this depiction and to thereby provide an identification of this very moment. On Yom Kippur, there is a prayer that follows immediately after the Haftarah, not one in the late afternoon, but one in the morning or at the turn of the day. This prayer is known by its first word, Yizkor, in which Ashkenazic Jews for centuries pleaded to God to remember and keep safe the souls of those beloved by them who had passed away. But in the instant before the prayer begins, something else often occurs. Whatever the source for this may be, at that moment, those whose immediate loved ones are all alive usually leave the synagogue so that they will not seem to be reciting Yiskor for those who still live. The conclusion of the prophetic reading of the Haftorah is thus followed by the announcement of what is to come, Yizkor. And this ignites a very brief flurry of activity in the sanctuary before the Chazan ascends to the Bima to lead the prayers that follow. It is this very instant, I would suggest, 
that Marisa Gottlieb has captured here. That is why no one seems to be praying at this moment. And that is why the child, young Marisa Gottlieb, seems to be on the brink of departure from the sanctuary. In Europe, parents would usually stay for Yizkor to remember their parents who passed away, while the children would by and large leave. As for the children who depart in that moment, in the blissful innocence of youth, little meaning is found in that experience. It is often for them a chance to take a break from what seems to be often monotonous prayers and to escape from the prim and proper behavior that parents rightly demand during tefillah, during worship. But looking back with the hindsight of maturity, children can well revere the resonance of that moment. Parents stay while children depart. It is an implicit reminder that one day those children will stay because those who now stay will ultimately depart. That coming and going that follows the cry, Yizkor, is the ultimate embodiment of one of the opening verses that is often recited in Yizkor itself. Adam la hevel dama, yamav kitzelover. Man is but a breath, his days a passing shadow. Or as Gottlieb put it to his friend, we have little time on this earth. Children, of course, do not understand any of this. But if they did, then rather than rejoice in their fleeting vacation from prayer, they would cling more tightly to their parents, to the mothers and fathers next to whom they sit. But only upon achieving maturity can they look back and understand that the announcement of Yizkor following the Haftarah is actually an exhortation to remember what matters and that the ability to sit together with those we love is a sacred gift. Understood this way, the motif of the many Maurices in the painting suddenly takes on a raw and profound poignancy. On the left, one version of young Gottlieb prepares to depart, but on the right, the other stays close to his father. What joins the two together is the adult Maurice, who, seemingly sensing the symbolism of this moment, reflectively considers both versions of his younger self, but also ponders in the plaque upon the Torah, his own mortality made manifest. Sensing the true symbolism of Yizkor, he is quite literally allowing his life to pass before our eyes. Understood this way, Gottlieb seems to give us a somewhat morbid meditation. But there is perhaps, upon closer examination, one more essential element in the artwork, one more sublime secret to be discovered, one which teaches us that this painting is not only about mortality, but also eternity. If you study the adult Gottlieb's posture in the painting, we note something surprising. He seems to be leaning on the Torah scroll itself. This is shocking because in real life, no one would dare to do so. And the painting thus brings to mind Rembrandt's great depiction of Jeremiah mourning for the destruction of the temple. Here, with Jerusalem burning in the background, Jeremiah places his head in his hand, almost exactly as Maurice does, with a similar look of meditation and despondency. But at the same time, the prophet leans on a book, which reads, Bible. The meaning is clear. Even in the midst of loss, it is the word of God that sustains him. Here, too, the motif seems similar. Gottlieb leans on the Torah, depends on the Torah. It is, seemingly, his existential source of support. But there is more. Gottlieb's plaque marking his passing also hangs from the Torah, from the scroll's handle, which is colloquially called the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life. He leans on it in life and is linked to it, connected to it, after he has left this world. Gottlieb has given us here the Torah as the tree of life on which all hangs and on which all depends. The Torah as a bridge between this world and the next, between what we are and what we will be, joining heaven and earth. Gottlieb's choice of motif was echoed many years later in an image 
which the artist himself could never have imagined. When Ilan Ramon became the first Israeli astronaut to journey to outer space, he took with him a tiny Torah scroll, which a Dutch rabbi by the name of Simon Dasberg had used to convene a clandestine bar mitzvah for a young boy in a concentration camp in Dachau. Rabbi Dasberg perished in the camps. And on a live broadcast to all of Israel while in orbit, Ramon told the rabbi's tale. Holding the Torah aloft, Ramon called it a chut chevel hamikasher, Ma'od Miragesh, a deeply emotional tie that binds. And then, in one amazing moment, Ramon's grip on the Torah loosened, and the scroll began to float further toward the heavens. Watching the broadcast was Rabbi Dasberg's daughter, who called it a drishat shalom min hashamayim, siman chayim min ha'avar, a hello from heaven, a sign of life from the past. In the Torah we are one. It provides a chut chevel hamikasher, a siman chayim min ha'avar. Mortality is a fact of life, but through the sanctity of the Torah and Jewish time, the barriers between past and present can suddenly dissipate. It is Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik who noted that Jews today in the Ashkenazic communities recite Yizkor not only on Yom Kippur, but also on the joyous festivals. And I would add that it is on these holidays that Sephardim also recite Hashkabot, or memorial prayers. And while all this may seem inappropriate because we are forbidden from mourning in joyous moments, nevertheless, Rabbi Soloveitchik suggested that even as it is true, that to remember is to miss and to mourn. Nevertheless, to feel that we can commune with those we love, to sense the distance between us and those we miss fall away, and to feel the continuity between us, to understand how in the Torah we are one, this can be a source of intense and inner joy. This year has been utterly unlike any in recent memory, one where the fragility of life on which Maurice Gottlieb so stunningly reflects has been made radically clear. In these many months of danger and illness and social distancing, we suddenly realize that we often take for granted the gift that is sitting beside those we care about, praying with them and praying for them. Gottlieb reminds us that Judaism joins generations, both those alive in this world who are physically apart, as well as those who dwell on high, and that on the holiest of days, we are praying together with those we love, when finitude connects to eternity. This new year, we ask for God to grant us long life, but life, however long, is limited. And so, we also beseech the Almighty that this life be lived in communion with the Torah and thereby in union with those who came before. As Gottlieb created this painting, his ancestors in a vision beseeched him, bring us back to life. In the most sacred of moments, this is a clarion call addressed to all of us. And during the days of awe, through devotion to the Torah, those we love can live again. <laughs>